Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first uh, of a series of webinars. We'll be, we're, we'll be talking about what may or may not be in the upcoming federal budget and how it relates uh, to the environmental file and the work we do here at, at Smart Prosperity. So we've got four different webinars and today is our first and it's looking at what policies might we see involving unlocking barriers to private investment in low carbon solutions. So we're going to be looking at, you know, what might be in the federal budget that would help, you know, whether it's investors, businesses, consumers, or so, so on, uh, invest in low carbon solutions, but also why? Like why might the federal government make the decisions uh, that it's making around the federal budget? But before I do any of that, I, I wanna give you a claim that will, I think, explain what the federal government may be trying to accomplish. And the claim is this. The, the claim is that Canadian demand for low carbon technologies will double through 2030 compared with to today's level. So what that means is that, you know, in this, you know, last decade or so, we've, we've seen an annual average of $11 billion per year invested by Canadians, and that's, that's consumers and, and firms and so on, in low carbon technologies. And that over the next decade, between 2020 and 2030, uh, will double to $22 billion annually. So there's going to be all of this pent up demand for low carbon solutions. And in our view, the federal government uh, will first of all recognize this, but it's secondly, uh, start to, to float some policies, put things into, into budgets uh, that will help turn this demand into a reality. So I'm going to couch this discussion uh, around four questions. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is obviously just like, what do we mean by a low carbon technology? What, what is it? Secondly, again, I made a claim here. I said, okay, that the demand for low carbon technologies will double. Well, how do we know that? Where's that coming from? You know, how reliable is that? Third is if I can get you to believe the claim, what, you know, what, what does that say about the specifics of it? Okay, we know low carbon, or if we believe that low carbon technologies uh, will, their, their demand will double over the next 10 years, which, uh, which technologies will there be? Because low carbon, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of different things. And then finally, once we have an understanding of all that, go, okay, knowing what we know about the demand for low carbon technologies, how does the federal government respond to that? You know, what are the kinds of policy instruments they could use, first of all? So what could they do? And secondly, what are they likely to do in, in budget 2020, which are obviously two different things. So what do we mean by low carbon technology? Well, it's basically any process, product, or services that reduces the greenhouse gas emissions associated with a product or activity. So these technologies can be applied and developed in every sector of the economy from transportation to large industry. So it's basically any piece of, of technology, equipment, or process that would take something that already exists but reduce the greenhouse gas uh, footprint of that. So I can be a little bit more specific about that. So the first would be re renewable fuels. So the idea is uh, fuels that could replace, uh, could replace diesel, could re replace gasoline with a lower uh, GHG uh, version of this. So a lot of sort of renewable fuels, uh, renewable uh, natural gas and that kind of thing. So that's the first type. Uh, second type obviously would be low carbon vehicles. And I'm sure this is the one that, that people sort of instantly thought of uh, when we talked about low, low carbon technologies as you know, taking vehicles that are, are internal combustion engine uh, and replacing those uh, with uh, battery hybrid um, fuel cells. You know, there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different options here. Uh, but the idea is again, re re replace an internal combustion engine with some form of drivetrain that is lower GHG. Third would be your industrial decarbonizations. Uh, so these, you know, things are like 
carbon capture and storage, uh, you know, methane abatement equipment for, for landfills, uh, fuel switching, heat pumps, that kind of thing. But basically, uh, any kind of industrial process to reduce GHG. So uh, an example would be um, the aluminum plant in Quebec that's, uh, that, that's set up to uh, produce zero uh, GHGs of uh, aluminum. So that's the kind of thing we're, we're thinking about there. Decarbonize electricity. Um, so basically going from, from coal or natural gas or some other form of electricity generation that involves greenhouse gases to a low or zero carbon version of that, which includes not just solar and hydro, but also nuclear is in here as well as, as a potential option. And then finally, building efficiency and electrification. Um, so how can we make buildings more, uh, more energy efficient? And that could be you know, retrofit of existing buildings, but also, um, you know, also uh, new build. So those are the five areas we mean by low carbon technology. Okay, so now we know what, what is and what isn't low carbon technology, we can identify this specific claim that I made. And the specific claim, again, was that between 20, 2020 and 2030, the demand for low carbon solutions will be double that of the previous decade. Well, how do we know that? Well, we, we know that from a report that uh, SPI put together uh, last year uh, called Growing Clean. And the basis of this report used the Navius Research GTEC model. It was not just used in that report, but if you saw the construction and carbon reports, uh, it was the same model used there as well. So basically how, how we use the model is we, we take the existing suite of policies. So that's things uh, like, like cap and trade and so on. And over time, we ratchet up um, uh, ratchet up the stringency of those policies in order to uh, hit the 2030 target. So it's, a, it's actually a suite of existing policies. It's not just, uh, you know, solely carbon pricing, but it's basically take the existing suite of policies as of 2018 or 2019, slowly ratchet up their intensity so you're able to hit, a, um, hit, hit the Paris targets of uh, 2030 target by uh, a 30% reduction by 2030. Um, and that target is through a combination of reduction, but also purchase capping trade credits. It assumes uh, the purchase of, of about 31 megatons of credits uh, between sort of Quebec and California and that, uh, that market in the year 2030. So it's not wholly domestic uh, reductions. There are some cap and trade purchases in there. So that's, you know, that's how we arrived to that figure. And that's how we saw the doubling. So I should point that out, that the, the doubling was not an input in the model, it was an output. We basically ratcheted up uh, the stringency of these policies and that's, that's what the model uh, spat out. And it's a very sophisticated model because you can divide by province, you can divide by different, uh, different clean tech and so on. And it also will show you, and we'll see this in a minute, what happens to other sectors of the economy? Uh, you know, what happens to fossil fuels? What happens to construction? Again, it was the basis of our uh, construction and carbon report as well. So where will the investments be? Well, first of all, this is what the investments look like. So our average before 2020 was about 10.9 billion a year. Our average annual to 2020, between 2020 and 2030 is uh, 22.2. And that's also net present value at 3% uh, a year. So there's a discount rate applied um, as well. So this is, in some sense, this is in real dollars. This is not sort of uh, nominal. This is not, you know, inflation playing a role here. This is, you know, this is actual real dollars. So this graph is particularly important because it, it not only shows the scale of investments around other investments, but it also shows what happens to other uh, sectors, energy sectors of the economy. So um, first of all, so low carbon investment goes from again, 11 billion a year to 22 billion a year. So, so doubles, uh, but that does not come at the expense of other sectors of the economy. This is not, so much sort of a fuel switching kind of thing, where's the, you know, the, the pie stays the same size and we're just sort of reallocating the pieces. That in fact, 
other forms of energy investments uh, still still increase by about two billion. So not not very much, but you know you they're at least staying flat. But investment in fossil fuel production, again, this is mostly um, natural gas and the oil sands, is still projected to rise. And that's due to the sort of global demand uh, for these products. So this is not, again, this is not the case that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing these clean energy necessarily displace uh, fossil fuel production. In fact, we're seeing significant increases in, in fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuel production, over the next decade, you know, this is what the model shows us. And again, this is, we're, you know, we need to keep the, the scale here where we're seeing about $22 billion in low carbon investments per year and $95 billion per year in investment in fossil fuel production. So it's still a relatively modest slice of the pie. It's a growing one, but it's still relatively modest. If we break that $22 billion further, uh, we can uh, break it down into those, those five areas that I mentioned. And we see here that decarbonized electricity uh, sees the bulk of this, which is, should not be surprising. Um, you know, there's a bunch of coal plants uh, that are slated to close over the next, uh, next 10 years. Those need to be replaced by something. We expect a lot of uh, solar and wind. Uh, there's probably not going to be any new nuclear build over the next 10 decades, but uh, over the next 10 years, the next decade. Uh, but there's likely to be some refurbishment as well. So this is what, uh, you know, this is what we're expecting to, to 2030 is, you know, the bulk of this is going to be in decarbonized electricity. Um, the other three of the other sectors, de industrial decarbonization, uh, building efficiency and low carbon vehicles are each worth about 15%. And we see a little bit of investment in renewable fuels, but not, not very much in absolute terms. It's, a, it's only about 1% of the total. You know, it's about 200 million a year. That's not nothing, but you know, in a, in a $2 trillion economy like Canada, it's a very small, very small slice. But even though that these are a small slice, uh, not just, uh, not just the renewable fuels, but in general, again, I'm just going to go back here for a second. Again, looking at this 22 billion, again, we say, okay, well, that's a relatively small piece of, of the, the, the pie when it comes to energy investment. The growth rate is significant, again, because it's starting at sm such a small base. So when we look at fossil fuel production, we say, okay, well, that's large and increasing. Because it's starting from a very large base, industrial fossil energy production is only slated to grow about 3% a year. Again, so it's big in absolute values, but the growth rate is relatively modest. Whereas low carbon investment for industry, low carbon investment in total is slated between rise between nine to 10%. So it's an important distinction to keep in mind that although you know, fossil fuels are large, are growing, their growth rate is relatively modest uh, as compared to low carbon technologies. They're just starting at a much, much larger base. So to summarize that before I get into the policy, again, we, I, I really want you to take away three things from this. The first, clean tech investments are slated to grow by, you know, according to our projections, according to our model, by nine to 10% per year. Again, from a relatively model, modest base. In dollar terms, more than half of the new clean tech or I shouldn't say clean tech, low carbon technologies and energy. And then finally, the, the low carbon investment does not displace fossil fuel. Rather, the overall energy pie is growing in our, our scenario. Again, uh, thanks to growing global demand uh, for, for energy solutions. So we can now get into the policy responses, but. I imagine a bunch of you have in the back of your mind, this idea is like, well, if this is gonna happen anyway, if, you're, if your models are projecting all of this investment is going to take place, well, why do you need public policy at all? Like if, if this is just gonna happen, then you know, what, what possible role is there uh, for the federal government here? And in, in fact, we'll see, I think there's at least four reasons why the federal government needs to, 
I, pre I predict and I believe the federal government needs to be involved in this. First is, again, recall that the projection assumes increasing stringency of existing policy. So what we might see in federal budgets over the next 10 years, it, it might not necessarily be new policies, but rather increasing existence, uh, increasing um, stringency of existing policy. I mean, that very well might be what we see. And in some sense, that is already baked in to the model. So just to hit the, the, those projections by itself, we need those increasing uh, stringency. Secondly, again, even if you believe the model, and, and I do believe the model, um, that even if you uh, believe that the federal government will increase the stringency of policy at the same rate that, that we project, there's still going to be 31 megatons short there's still gonna be 31 megatons short. So those are carbon credits that will have to be purchased. And that cost will be, uh, that cost will be billions of dollars, right? So if you assume the carbon price in 2030 is 100 bucks a ton, that's $3.1 billion. That's a lot of money. So the, we can reduce that cost by having an additional set of policies, right? So we can reduce that 31 megatons. We also have to recognize that that 31 megatons and all of these projections are just a project, are a projection, and that projection has an error bound, right? That that projection is just sort of a median project, projection. There's a lot that could be changed, you know, depending on the state of the economy, state of technological developments. We won't exactly hit that. We could overshoot it. We could undershoot it. So the federal government may want to provide a cushion. You know, instead of trying to hit the median projection, try and hit you know one or two standard deviations off of that. So they might want to go above and beyond. And fourth, the federal government, I think, realizes that the accelerated adoption of clean tech in Canada creates a market for domestic firms. You know, you're going to see domestic firms help out when it comes to things like the production of electric vehicles. You know, we have electric bus manufacturing here in Canada, you know, help with some of the, those heat pumps and carbon capture and storage and solutions for buildings and, and all those kinds of things. So if we create that domestic market here in Canada, that's going to help our Canadian low carbon firms, our Canadian clean tech firms create that domestic market. And once they start selling to that domestic market and building up scale, they can then sell those products to the rest of the world. So it creates a competitive business opportunity uh, for Canadian firms. I think, I believe the federal government recognizes that. So that's why they may be more aggressive. They may use some of these policy tools uh, in order to, to facilitate that. So here's, now let's look at what they could possibly do. And let's look at the sort of the art of the possible. I would say that if what we're looking at is unlocking barriers to private investment and low carbon solutions, and again, we'll be looking at other things um, in, in future webinars, but if what we're trying to do is accelerate private investment in low carbon solutions, I think there's five likely avenues they could pursue to do this. And I'll go through the five. The first is finding, uh, increasing the R&D of clean tech, right? And that could be, you know, the obvious one would be through shred uh, federal R&D tax credits. You make those more lucrative, you, you tweak those in some way, you're, you know, you're going to see more private investment. Um, could be research for funding for higher ed, so you develop, you know, there's more funding for sort of early stage research at, at universities, colleges, and polytechnics. Over time, that will uh, turn into more, more companies, more private products, that kind of thing. You know, it could be uh, research that the government does on its own through things like the National Research Council. But it's basically sort of an R&D play that you fund more R&D and over time that R&D, you know, goes through a variety of different uh, technology readiness levels and uh, turns into a, a developed product. 
So that's, a, that's the first sort of big broad bucket of, of things the federal government could do. Second is they could aid clean tech scale ups and startups, particularly with financing. You know, that's usually when you, in clean tech, uh, that tends to be the, the biggest bottleneck uh, for, for startups and scale ups, young companies, is, is accessing dollars. And that's both just dollars in general, but it's also smart dollars, uh, which, you know, come with, uh, you know, managerial competence and that kind of thing. So there are a variety of ways you could do that. Um, the first uh, could be something like uh, Vicky Stream 3, VCCI Stream 3, which is the uh, venture capital uh, fund that I said put together for, for cleantech. Could be through Business Development Canada, or it could just be things like tax credits. Uh, next week's webinar, we're going to spend a lot of time on a variety of different tax credits they could use, you know, when you would use certain ones. But at a high level, that's, that's what they could do. Third uh, is they could figure out ways to remove regulatory barriers preventing the development or adoption of, of clean technology. So, and we hear this a lot uh, from, uh, from, from clean tech uh, firms. Uh, you know, NR Store, I won't, I won't tell the story here, but NR Store, uh, a company here in Canada, uh, has a classic story of how one of their energy storage projects uh, up in Godrich, all the regulatory hurdles they had to go through to make, make this work. Um, here in Ontario, for instance, for a while, uh, malls could not put in electric vehicle charging stations because that was considered the resale of energy. That's a provincial example, not a federal one. But you know, there are a lot of regulations at both the federal, provincial, and even municipal level that for whatever reason, prevent the development and adoption of clean technology. Um, so the federal government could look to that and go, okay, are there, are we unnecessarily creating barriers to low carbon uh, development and, and technology? Um, so that we had six, I said had six sector roundtables. Uh, regulatory com, uh, regulatory issues came up in a couple of them. The federal government has created their external advisory committee on regulatory competitiveness. Um, so this is an area that's on the federal government's radar. I think they can and do more on this. And that's something that we may see announced either in this budget or future budgets. So that's the third thing they can do. So that's sort of a, not, I wouldn't say less regulation, but streamlined regulation process. But they could actually use regulation as a tool uh, to uh, accelerate innovation, the, the so-called Porter hypothesis, that well-designed environmental regulations can actually spur on innovation. So an obvious one, you know, looking at regulations requiring the use or sale of cleaner technologies. So that's things like the low carbon fuel standards, that's things like fuel efficiency standards. So, you know, putting uh, enhancing fuel efficiency standards on passenger cars, you know, may, might incense uh, either cleaner internal combustion engine or, you know, might cause firms, uh, you know, cars, car, car companies to transition faster from internal uh, combustion vehicles to uh, electric vehicles. So well-designed regulations uh, can spur uh, environmental innovation and again, that's the, the classic Porter hypothesis. So the, that's something the federal, this federal government has done in the past. I think they'll, they'll do again in the future. And then finally, there's a variety of different incentives for adoption of, of clean technologies by firms, individuals, and so on. So uh, in last year's budget, for instance, we saw a variety of electric vehicle tax credits. Um, so this was for adoption of passenger cars and charging stations and, and things like that. Uh, we've also seen in the past uh, changes to accelerated capital cost allowance for firms to basically incenting businesses, you know, using the tax code, allowing businesses to write off their investments in clean tech adoption faster uh, will incent them to adopt more clean tech. 
We're going to talk a lot in next week's webinar about uh, accelerated capital cost allowance, what the government did in the past, and how they could uh, build on that in the future. So again, there's a lot there. So those are the five big broad buckets I think the federal government could use to unlock barriers to private investment in low carbon solutions, but those aren't exhaustive. There are other things that they could do you know, around labor market policies and, and things like that. But the, I, I see those as the five biggest areas. So now we know what they could do, let's go to what they actually will do. So what I'm gonna be looking for over the next month when I think about these five broad buckets, the two obvious places to look would be, you know, trial balloons, you know, looking for things that the prime minister or various ministers or members of parliament are floating out there. Plus, obviously, you know, we just had an election. So looking at what was in the liberal platform, would give us a pretty good indication of where the government's going. So we saw just earlier this week, I believe it was Monday, uh, the prime minister was at a mining conference and he talked about uh, changes to accelerated capital cost allowance or, and to tax credits that would allow uh, businesses uh, to faster write off or tax credits uh, for electric vehicles um, and, and fuel cell vehicles and that kind of thing for, for big sort of off-road um, uh, electric vehicles, again, used in the mining industry and other industries, some more sort of heavy industry type things. So since the prime minister mentioned this at a mining conference recently, it would be surprising if that wasn't in, in there again. So, they, you know, the government's already starting to, to float suggestions or ideas of, of what it might do. A big one that was announced uh, during the campaign that um, I believe they'll end up doing in this budget is what they announced was that if you're a manufacturer and you manufacture zero emissions uh, products, so again, think of uh, you know, if you had an automotive company in, in Canada, uh, for instance, that was making electric vehicles, that that um, company would be able to receive tax credits, which would essentially reduce their, their federal corporate tax rate in half. It would go from 15% to 7.5%. Um, historically, you know, the federal government has used this for decades. It used to be uh, that manufacturers would have a lower corporate tax rate. That ended about 10 years ago. And basically what happened was that the corporate tax rate was lowered, such that it, it basically converged to the manufacturing tax rate. And it's, a, it's a single tax rate now. But what the federal or what the liberals announced uh, during the campaign is they basically bring back that model uh, for, uh, for zero emissions manufacturing companies. The devil's in the details, obviously, because you have to figure out, you know, what's the threshold, you know, what, who is and isn't considered a zero emissions manufacturing company. So there's a lot of details that the federal government's, you know, finance, the CRA, I said, are going to have to work out. But it would be surprising to me, at least, if they didn't at least put the first steps in this budget. So look for that. Um, there was a lot in the budget, and I won't go through all of it, but there was a lot on this um, household, um, you know, reducing the carbon footprint for, for buildings. Uh, so interest-free loans, home retrofits, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of that is services, so it's not really private investment, though uh, part of these dollars, I do anticipate, you know, would go into things like smart thermostats and things like that. Things that would actually be considered low carbon investments. So help people uh, buy newly built homes that are, are certified zero emissions. And again, uh, likely some form of skills piece to, you know, to help uh, actually get these homes built and installed, help you uh, install more fuel efficient, uh, you know, water heaters and, and those So that's what I expect to see in the budget. So uh, uh, 
uh, in the next 10 placing fossil fuel or other investments rather the the energy going to increase over time uh just due to increasing uh, global demand secondly policy will help accelerate this investment that you know that doubling isn't just going to happen on its own um, it's going to require a suite of federal policies but the federal government if it so wanted to and i believe it will can be more aggressive than our model allows can do more than a doubling with the use of smart pol public policy those public policies again include you know r and you know increased funding for r d assistance with firm financing regulatory reform regulatory instruments and adoption incentives again plus more and between trial balloons and liberal platform i think we have a pretty good idea of what's going to be in this budget when it comes to uh, low carbon or no carbon policy there's always a surprise you know federal governments of any political stripe always kind of throwing a curveball there's always uh, something you're not expecting but that said, I, I think we, we already have a pretty good idea of 80 to 90% of, of what's going to be in there. So thank you. Uh, thank you for attending uh, the webinar. Um, you all have my email address. So if you have any more, more questions uh, or any thoughts, uh, I would really appreciate your feedback. So again, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending.